So I'd like to start by acknowledging that Murdoch University is situated on the lands of the Wajuk Noongar people and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land is an important first step towards working towards reconciliation. So I'd like to invite you all to um, just silently think about where you're joining us from and the history of the land that you're joining us from. Um, whether that be somewhere else in Australia or in the world, it's great to see we have people from um, all over the world joining us today. So thanks everyone for being here for um, uh, May startup morning. I can't believe it's May. Um, I'm Genevieve, I work at Launchpad. And Launchpad, for those of you who um, are not familiar with, with us, we're Murdoch University's innovation hub. So we help students who you know, want to start their own business or um, social enterprise or movement, um, we support them to take their idea from, you know, the early stages of just an idea to actually getting it off the ground. Um, and we also have recently merged with careers. So now we also focus on um, supporting students with all kinds of skills that, that are in high demand in workplaces of the future. So lots of different workshops and things. Um, so I'm really excited to hear from our two presenters today, and I'm sure you all, all are too. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jeremy now. Jeremy is our entrepreneur in residence, and he's been with Launchpad from the start, I believe, well before I, I started at Launchpad. Um, and he's helped so many students to, um, students and people in the wider community, staff as well, um, to build their businesses. So Jeremy? Yeah, thanks very, thanks very much for that, Jen, and a great introduction and an overview of what we do at Launchpad. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody, and I see a lot more people joining as well, and I'm sure as the, the session progresses, we'll have a few more uh, joining the call as well. So I'd like to welcome everybody and thank everybody for dedicating an hour of their day uh, to support our startup ecosystem, and it's great to see people coming from all over uh, Australia, but also down the world, So, which is great, so welcome. Um, as Jen was saying, I'm the entrepreneur in residence at Murdoch University for, for Launchpad. I'm also a former student of the university um, and accepted this position uh, over three years ago from the then VC, um, basically because I wished I had someone on campus uh, to help me when I was starting Student Edge. Um, so the, the role I play at, at Launchpad is really, I believe, critical for any young entrepreneur or any entrepreneur um, that's wanting to take an idea and make it into reality, catching up with someone that's really walked the path before and sharing the good stories, but also sharing the war stories. Um, and part of um, our Launchpad, I guess, program and offering throughout the years, we do the startup uh, morning. And we're only doing it four times a year. This is our second one for this year. Um, and I'm really pleased to announce that we've got two amazing founders this morning that are going to share their stories. Um, but basically, the format is very simple. So we give both founders this morning six minutes uh, to pitch their idea. And in this instance, both our founders are actually pitching uh, for, the, for the first time, um, which is really amazing. And we've got one founder that's unwell as well, that, but still going to pitch. So this is all part of the, the journey uh, of being an entrepreneur. Even when you're down and out, you're still pitching up uh, or showing up and, and pitching. So uh, yeah, so six minutes, and then after six minutes, um, I'll be facilitating some questions uh, from the audience. I'll kick it off, of course, but if you wanted to drop some questions in the chat, if you're not able to ask it out um, online uh, or on video, that's fine. I'll do it for you. Uh, otherwise, I'll actually throw to you. So just raise your hand, and I'll throw to you to ask the question to the founder. So six minutes, uh, Jen, I'll leave you to, to do the timing uh, for us this morning. Uh, six minutes, and the way we're going to start this morning is we're going to start with our first founder, uh, who I said is, is, is unwell this morning, but still going to pitch. So thank you, Ashna, uh, who's the co-founder of Amigos. Uh, she's based out of Melbourne and hoping to change the, uh, I guess, space in terms of how uh, residential uh, villages and campus living villages uh, manage their residents, manage their students' uh, accommodation better. Uh, she's hoping to change the way that's done in, into the future in a more smarter, sophisticated way. Uh, I'd like to introduce Asha uh, today, this morning, to present Amigos. Ashna. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm going to share my screen. And I'll go on mute. And we'll start the timer when you go. Um, yeah, the timer can start now. 
So who are we? Amigos is a resident management and engagement platform for student accommodation, school living and built to rent communities. And why we want to focus primarily on these three communities is because we do believe that they are the future of living. Um, and why do we get, I think in an era where post pandemic anxiety and depression are becoming widespread, we are placing our bets on the success of residential communities that prioritize the needs of their residents. Um, which is why I said we do perceive these kind of communities to be the future of living. These are some of the communities that place residents at the crux of their success. To do that, we need to understand the problem of operators and enable them to prioritize residents through their partnership with the right technology. Now, this is what a current journey of a resident paying anywhere between $300 to $600 a week for such communities looks like. Um, once they actually browse the accommodations website for rooms, um, they would be looking at booking the rooms through a third party portal. In this case, it would be one of our competitors. They would then go on to make a payment, um, which honestly is quite a hassle given a lot of the students that on board are from various different parts of the world. And then they go on to sign their lease, confirm their place as residents over email, and then residents would usually pay rent upfront or incur a massive charge for other forms of payment. And once they're onboarded as residents, they're usually given one too many apps for community engagement. So here we're actually seeing there's no omni channel for taking residents on an end to end journey through one single platform. Residents will often find themselves jumping from one platform to another while paying a rental premium uh, for becoming a part of this community. And then similarly, the journey of a property manager paying $100,000 or more looks even more inefficient because much like the residents jumping from one platform to another, that's as many platforms to manage for property managers who are actually paying $100,000 or more in any SaaS system that they're currently using. And on top of that, a lot of them get charged $30,000 or more in, in rental payment collections. So I think the problem that we recognized was that data is firstly dispersed ac across platforms, different platforms that tackle booking, management, and communication, which easily cost property managers upwards of $100,000 per building in pure inefficiencies, because there's no one out there who wants to create a single platform for student accommodations. Now, the solution that we thought that we would come up with is to provide a seamless flow for operators by bringing booking, management and communication under the one platform whilst providing residents with a one-stop shop solution for all their residential needs. So essentially bringing property managers and residents on the single journey all the way from booking till the time residents become a part of the community and off board. So our vision is actually to become Revolut for those of, who, those of you who know Revolut for residential communities to serve as a one-stop shop solution for both the residents and the operators. I think in an ideal world, we would be looking at one SaaS provider who does everything from community engagement to bookings and management system with, with all of these systems interacting seamlessly instead of different, different platforms doing different bits without having to interact with each other. The market size is uh, roughly 500,000 buildings across Europe, Canada, UK, and Australia alone, with 50 million plus residents across these buildings. And there are 200,000 buildings in construction this year alone, with this number supposed to be exponentially higher from next year onwards. Now, the business model that we're looking at includes a sub subscription charge for per building per month, which is much less than what our SaaS uh, competitors charge right now. And then we, because we're a resident first platform, we do intend on also um, curating an Amigos marketplace, which would just be putting businesses who advertise to our residents forward and charging commissions from them. And then we also plan on developing way into the future an accommodation marketplace, which would be a marketplace solely for the operators. So right now, as we currently stand, uh, since we're only tackling the community engagement platform side of the things, which is one third of the problem that we want to solve, we're actually charging our partners $300 per month for that. 
our competitors, if this is a super simplified slide, to be honest, I would, uh, I would say our competitors are way more in number than the ones that you see here, but these are the competitors that we look out for. Um, Lively is a community management system based in the US, has nothing to do with uh, bookings or payments. Stars is actually the competitor that we look at, which is an incumbent in the Australian market, university focused, way too expensive for student accommodations or any kind of communities that we've spoken about. Alfred is exclusively built for luxury apartments based predominantly out of the US. The way we see Amigos is that we become all in one tool for bookings, payments, management and communication charging one flat rate per month. Definitely not half as expensive as Star is. The traction that we received off of our community uh, engagement platform that we've deployed for one of our partners, Campus Path, is um, that we've streamlined all the communication from Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, all kinds of platforms they might be using on the single community feed. Uh, we introduced an assist page for raising issues with different feeds through the phone itself. Uh, we have an event calendar, a marketplace for residents, and document storage for centralization of all the communication. And what we've actually seen so far is um, in the four months that we've had Amigos up and running, over 60% of the content is generated by residents with over 200 posts every month. 42 minutes was our average monthly engagement rate last month, which has increased uh, way beyond 50 minutes to this month. 92% was our notification flick rate and why we consider that important is that uh, it shows that residents are highly engaged with the updates that are coming out of their community's um, uh, platform and then 120 plus issues logged and resolved each month. Earlier, this bill was extremely broken and to see that there are 120 plus issues being logged and resolved each month actually gives us a very big insight into how streamlined their operations have gotten ever since Amigos took over a lot of these operations. Now, the immediate goals that we're looking at uh, would be to introduce Amigos in a co-living community, uh, primarily to see how well we can deploy the same model in a co-living space. We do want to expand our Amigos marketplace, of course, um, bring in businesses that would that would benefit from uh, advertising to the residents that are using our platform. We do want to develop the functionality for booking spaces and payment processing. Booking spaces is something that becomes important for poor living uh, communities. And we're also looking at SAA membership, which is uh, one of one of the um, uh, premier student accommodation associations in Australia. What does our team look like? I'm one of the co-founders of Amigos. Uh, my other co-founder is based out of uh, Singapore and both of us started this. this uh, I, I think we had this idea about a year and a half back and we've, we've come this far completely with in-house skills, having taken up responsibility for all different things that we needed to. We do have uh, both our lead developer, Samson, who's on call right now, who built the platform from scratch to what you see right now being used by a community of 700 residents and, and perhaps being deployed in a co-living community as well. The entirety of the skills are in-house. We do have Lee Paul Ford, who's the director at Casita, and Jeremy Jenny, of course, uh, as, as two of our advisors that we often, often fester when, when we need. And what we're actually looking for at this point is student accommodations who will work with us in making this vision come true. Thank you. Well done, thanks very much for that, Ashna. Um, and uh, like I said, you were a trooper doing it while being unwell as well. So uh, thank you very much for that. Well done for a great presentation to us this morning. Um, okay, well, we're gonna dive into some questions. I'll kick it off. Um, but like I said, if those have got questions that they want me to ask, just drop it into the chat and Jen, I'll get you to help me uh, pick out those questions. Um, but if you want to ask one, just put the hand up uh, and I'll go through to you. Uh, first question. So, um, Ashna, can you tell us why you're doing this? Um, a lot of founders forget that, 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 that little story that, uh, of why, why even going into this, this, this industry, this um, yeah. I think that's a good question, Jeremy. I 
when I came to Australia in 2016 as an international student living in mm. one of the student accommodations is when I actually realized just how little they were spending on making sure that students like us uh, were easily able to engage with the community. Fast forward six years, the case still remains the same, right? Um, so I would actually go so far to say that education is being, you know, exported out of Australia to all different regions of the world without actually taking care how they can um, how they can actually mix these kind of students that are coming from all different parts of the world in the local culture. So there's a lot of talk around how we need international students, you know, how we need more students to come come back um, uh, to Australia. But no one's truly thinking about how these students are going to uh, curate their lives in Australia. Like for a lot of them, it's practically impossible, um, you know, to make friends. Or, or to go out of their way to find, you know, to become a part of this culture. And no one's really thinking about that. Um, so I think it's because of this myopic vision by a lot of um, student accommodations and universities, because unlike in the US, our universities are, are quite spread out, which means they're not specifically designed for social connections to get harbored. So I think it's primarily then that I saw this gap that, hang on, you're spending all this billions of dollars in you know, building university spaces and student accommodations, but not a single dollar is actually being spent on making sure that we are getting to know our local ecosystem. And so for a lot of us, we would, we would live in these student accommodations for two years and look back and realize, hey, hang on, except for the one person who sits at the front desk, I actually don't know anyone here. And wow. you're paying a rental premium for these kind of communities. So I think the problem is, is um, quite heartfelt for me that you pay this rental premium, but no one's out there actually making sure that you are becoming a seamless part of the community. And when you graduate, you actually have an advantage of paying this rental premium that you do at student accommodations. Yeah, like that, that's that's a fantastic reason. And I can see the, the passion <laughs> coming out yeah. here as you talk about it. And then that's why I asked the question is, um, a lot of these ideas start because it's a frustration point or it was a challenge or a problem for yourself personally. And in this case, of course, Amigos has been born out of that. So well done on taking that initiative and actually coming up with this. So that, that's really good to, to, to hear. And I agree with you. I think um, being in the student space as well, I think we don't do a really good job of looking after our international students. Uh, I think we do a good job smoothing them in and getting yeah. into the country. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but certainly maintaining and looking after that relationship with our international students, uh, anything uh, to be able to improve that experience onshore um, will be yeah, well, well received and welcome, of course. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, might throw to the audience, anyone got any questions? I do have a follow-up one, but just give me a raise of hand icon. Not yet. Okay. Well, everyone's still thinking. I might just drive straight into the second one. Um, in terms of the traction, can you just tell us, because there's some really good stats there from one of your clients, uh, Campus Perth. Um, when you say traction, are they actually a paying traction? Correct. Customer? Wow. That's fantastic. Can you tell us how, how did you get your first customer? Oh, that's, that's, that's a very interesting story. Um, <laughs> So I think it was it was uh, my sales skills were primarily focused on pestering people on LinkedIn, stalking them, uh, researching them, and then you know coming up with with a very specifically curated message on LinkedIn and seeing if it goes somewhere. And I think my success rate was about forty percent, which is good enough. Um, and it was primarily uh, due to that that I I got to know someone from from campus birth and uh, I just pestered them long enough if they wouldn't respond I would email them I would find different ways of keep following up and that you know there was a time when they were just like you know oh, oh my god Ashna enough we will give you a meeting if that's what you want and then I think going into the meeting because we didn't want to develop a product before we actually got someone on board it was me pretending that we already had a product so we made uh, pretty good slides proving to them that we did have a product uh, that was, you know, uh, ready to get used and, you know, whenever they decided. And yeah, that product that honestly we prototype was way more than what we actually developed. Um, but I think that's what helped us get them. It was a process of a year, which is what I always say that one of the challenges about being in this industry is the customer acquisition cycle is way too long. So it took a year of back and forth, not only with the property managers, but also investors um, 
So it was after a year that we finally got a crack. Wow. And wow. yeah, uh, it's after a year that I finally revealed to them once we signed the contract and everything that um, we actually do have to develop the product. So uh, <laughs> um, I mean, don't mind us. So I think we took better part of last year in developing the product with, with um, you know, their vision, which really helped us because, you know, it's much better when you're developing the product with the customer. Uh, well, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Look, that's great. And look, it shows all the different characteristics that a founder needs to have, which is that constant persistence, um, selling with passion and selling the future, even if you haven't built it. Uh, this is all part of the, the early stages of uh, being a founder. So thanks for sharing this reason why I asked that question. Um, okay, cool. Vanessa, uh, I know you're on the call, um, whether you would like to actually ask that question to, uh, to Ashna and then other people will start thinking about your questions as well. Hey, yeah, um, I always wonder this about all of the businesses that start up that uh, solve problems for other businesses. How do you get that knowledge of their business need and their current processes and their current finances so you can say this is going to solve, you know, there's a market for this, it's going to solve these costs and these issues that you've got. How did you engage with the business initially? Right. Uh, Vanessa, you'll actually be shocked as to how many people in the industry at really good positions would be willing to share their insights with you. So I went straight to, you know, directors uh, of investment management firms who are managing purpose-built student accommodations. Um, and these are multi-billion dollar investment managers, right? They were more than happy to share their insights and actually tell me what kind of problems they were facing in the industry. So it was actually conversations uh, that I had with investment managers, with directors, with CEOs at, you know, some of the biggest PBSAs. I mean, unless you're selling to them, which becomes a different case altogether, because these are really big accommodations. But if you go with the perspective that I just want to understand the problem and get insights from you so that in the future, maybe if I'm in a position that I can come back and pitch to you, then, you know, that would be something um, I think that's that's the angle that I took with a lot of the bigger accommodations that we knew that we weren't we weren't quite in the position to pitch to them, but we were in a position to learn from them. So uh, for me, again, LinkedIn was my go-to tool for getting in touch with a lot of lot of uh, property managers, investment managers, and you know the right stakeholders in the ecosystem. And those are people that I still speak with. So I think I drew a line between where my sales pitches were going, where my learnings were coming from. So th there were these cohort of people that I would derive the learnings from, uh, get insights into the problem from, and then you know the other cohort of people that I would pitch to. So I think that's 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 the um, you know the way I uh, divided the kind of people that I was you know speaking with. So yeah, you'd actually be shocked how how uh, welcoming people would be in you know if you're just trying to figure out a problem and get better insights from them. Thank you. Yeah, thank. Great question and great answer too. Um, as the old uh, tale, uh, Vanessa, founder land, that goes if you ask not, you receive not. So. <laughs> So founders just have this habit of just keeping, keep asking in a nice way. Uh, and in Nash's point of view, probably very persistently, and you do get some people that'll share. So anyway. Yeah, how else did I get to know you, Jeremy? So you can relate to it. That's right. I just realized that. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question. So Brittany, you, you put a question in there for Ashna. Yes. Hello. Um, my question was, because you're looking at international students, have you looked at making the apps, uh, the different versions of the app in different languages or providing that as an option? Because I'm just thinking like, um, you know, students that may come from overseas, English is their second language. Correct, Brittany. Um, good question. Honestly, we did start out by looking at at the problem from the lens of an international student, but we do want to bring all kinds of students or residents actually better yet in the fold of Amigos. Um, to be honest, we initially, when we didn't have a product, this was a feature that we doubted a lot that, you know, it was going to be available in Spanish, Chinese, and uh, all of that. But actually, when we started to developing the product, we realized just how difficult that was. Um, it's an extremely difficult task to provide a second language, especially knowing that a lot of the students come from China and integrating 
Chinese was extremely difficult. Um, so you know what? We just let it slide. We just didn't bring it up again with Campus Perth that that was something that we promised and they didn't remember. So yeah, we just let that one slide. To be honest, yeah, we didn't realize how difficult it was going to be until we got down to the of it. Um, yeah, and given that a lot of students come here with the intention of, you know, acclimating better within the English speaking culture, we thought, yeah, bringing them under under the one language would might might anyway be better. Um, because currently the platforms that they use are to their chosen form of language like WeChat or any other platform. So the whole point was to bring them on a single platform under the single language. But yeah, that's a good point. Um, we've definitely thought of that. And then we just, yeah, pivoted sort of. Awesome. No, great, great question. Um, any more from the audience? We've got a few minutes left. I'll ask a question. Yeah, sure. Um, Thanks, just following on from Brittany's question a bit, what are some of the, so you mentioned that like when you proposed this to Campus Perth, you had all these features. Um, and some of them weren't able to be realised in the final or in the prototype that you created. What are some of those features that you weren't able to kind of bring to life and some of the features, I guess, that you're, you're still wanting to, um, to work on and include in the future? Um, I think we rushed uh, before, uh, you know, it's like when you don't know just how much uh, development effort it might take and to be honest like as founders we were completely bootstrapped and let's be honest like most of us are broke right like we're looking for any cheap way to get things done and when we actually uh, got down to looking at the cheapest way to develop some of these features um, that actually knocked knocked us off and we were just like um so we're gonna have to really trim down on exactly what's important and then go from there like one of the features that we doubted was rental payments, right? And my one of, uh, you know, our lead developer, Samson, who's on the call can tell you just, just how complicated that is to develop. And for us, it was very easy to tell that we would be doing that. Oh yeah, don't worry about it. Your yeah, rental payment for sure can be done via our app. And it's, it's this year that we started thinking about it um, because we do want to develop it. But when we actually Got, got down to developing um, Amigos and realized just how much effort and money some of the things would take. Um, that's, that's when we actually had to take two steps back and understand that, okay, in our limited resources, what can actually be achieved and what's more important to be achieved. Um, but I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. rental payments is, has to be one of the heaviest uh, duty features that I can think of. We're tackling it this year perhaps, but yeah, um, that was something we started selling last year. Great question. Thanks, Jen. Probably got time for one more. It's just gone past 10 o'clock WA time. Um, so maybe one more question. Otherwise, I might close it out with mine from the audience. No. Okay. Ashna, what's the big picture? For Amigos, where, where, where do you see Amigos going in the future? What's what's your what's your big big plans for it? Honestly, I think the biggest uh, plan or or the biggest achievement for Amigos down the future, uh, you know, way into the future would be, like I said, to become revenue for student accommodation, and by that I mean like the end-to-end -end software provider for student accommodations, uh, co-living communities and built to rent communities. We're actually seeing a lot of investment being made in this new age uh, living style, uh, you know, uh, and, and honestly, we wanna capitalize on that kind of investment and actually become the platform that provides for the end-to-end -end needs of property managers from within these communities while bringing residents on, you know, a seamless journey. So I think where we would see ourselves headed, and it's a very bold vision to have, is actually to provide for all the needs of property managers uh, within these communities and, um, and for residents as well. So not actually tackling one part of the problem where we say that, yeah, we're just gonna own community engagement and the rest of it can be done by others. We're actually providing one, you know, seamless workflow for for all all our partners, which is honestly where we want to head um, 
you know, in the in the future, which is quite bold, honestly, and we're not sure if how how soon we would be able to realize it. But I think the future is, um, regardless of the industry you're in, to provide one seamless workflow for your customers, um, rather than having them jump from one platform to another. So I think that's where we'd be placing ourselves. No, that's a great that's a great vision, and that's bold. Um, but what I really like, which is the future, is that everyone wants things. Uh, done simply and I think the space that you're in if you can simplify that whole process for these organizations if there's just one platform I think that's where people are going to win um, is everything in one one platform rather than having multiple apps and dashboards and things to to measure uh, the key things you need to measure but um, so well done that's a that's a good big bold vision and uh, we wish you well so what I might do is um uh, before we switch to the next founder, I might just get everyone to unmute themselves and we do a round of applause for Ashton Nan, who's pitching well and well uh, this morning at our startup uh, morning online. Thank you. All right. So we're moving on to our next founder and I'd like to introduce to you uh, Brittany, who's the uh, co-founder of uh, Brightermans. I think I'm saying that right. Brightermans. Bridemans, 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 sorry, Bridemans. Um, uh, welcome uh, to Startup Morning, uh, Brittany. Uh, you've got six minutes uh, to share your presentation and pitch to us this morning. Okay, so I'm just bear with me. I'm not very technically inclined. Just wait. Okay, share screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Six minutes when you're ready to go. All right. Yes, wait. All right, perfect. I'll go now. So hello, my name is Brittany and I am the founder of Brittermans and we are Australia's first femtech platform that empowers women um, oh, um, through their journey into motherhood by taking the guesswork out of prenatal vitamins. So it all started when I was pregnant and I had the overwhelming experience of um, trying to purchase vitamins. So I went to the chemist and I found myself staring at thousands of bottles sitting on the shelf each brand boasted a one-size-fits-all solution, varied in ingredient quality, and meant that I had to organize my vitamins each day. So in Australia, 79% of women during pregnancy take a prenatal vitamin. However, this decision is not made easy for women due to several factors, which include the varying quality of ingredients between brands, women receive minimal guidance on the timing of specific vitamins to support their nutritional well-being at each stage of their pregnancy, and amongst evidence-based information is a sea of pseudoscience. So this lack of credible information leads to ineffective choices. So Brittemann solves this problem by, taking, by making the customer experience simple and convenient. So all you need to do is set it and forget it in three simple steps, steps while we handle the rest. So step one, we invite our customers to take an easy to do online quiz that asks questions about their current stage in the prenatal journey. Are they trying to conceive or are they currently pregnant? And if so, when is their due date? Step two, our online system utilizes this information and selects the appropriate vitamin pack tailored to their stage and initiates their monthly subscription. So step three, um, our $50 a month subscription model ensures that our customers receive their next 30 day vitamin pack automatically and will change as they progress through their prenatal journey. In Australia, 300,000 women give birth each year and 79% of those women took a prenatal vitamin during their pregnancy. Our target demographic is mothers aged 24 to 45 who have post-secondary education and are statistically more likely to take a prenatal vitamin. Our traction today starts in December, where the idea of Brittemans was developed and resulted in meetings with the TGA to discuss the legalities of setting a prenatal vitamin business, leading us to find an Australian manufacturer. In January, we completed research and development of our product offering with our Australian manufacturer, which included analysing potential aspects of risk mitigation and provided an opportunity to discuss an on-demand unit costing and logistics to reduce our inventory risk and our go-to-market costing. Um, in March, our product and our market and product validation survey received over 100 submissions within three days, demonstrating with great confidence our product validation and price point of about $50 a month. 
Since publishing our landing page, um, we have had over 400 unique visitors from organic traffic and have received four registrations of interest. So our notable, our notable co um, competitors fall into two distinct categories, those who provide vitamins on a subscription model versus a one-off purchase and those who primary business focuses on products that support prenatal health versus general health. Brittemans will enter the Australian market by focusing on, prenatal, on the prenatal journey. What makes us different is that Brittemans provides a one-stop shop that streamlines the process of purchasing vitamins that promote prenatal health through a convenient and simple subscription sorry, model. Our competitors currently provide a single prenatal vitamin, which requires women to purchase additional supplements, which may not be a part of their product offering. So we are currently pre-revenue. However, we have a clear plan to accelerate our startup over the next 12 months. In six months, we are looking at boosting our marketing campaigns and growing our brand awareness, establishing an advisory board to help guide our future product offerings, launch our MVP, um, hopefully in September, and getting our first thousand subscribers. In 12 months, we want to continue to accelerate our paid marketing channels and brand awareness to improve our unit economics. So we're wanting to move away from an on-demand model to scale production, um, continue to grow our product offering to offer upselling products. So that would be lactation cookies or um, iron supplements. And most ambitiously, our milestone at 12 months is to expand Brittemans into the Asian Pacific region. My name is Brittany Toledo and I'm a registered midwife and registered nurse with eight, over eight years of clinical experience within a variety of healthcare settings. I'm also an executive board member of the Australian College of Midwives WA branch. My co-founder and CTO CMO Bradley is an operations director of a marketing firm in Perth with over 14 years of digital marketing agency experience. This includes back and front, ed, um, front end web development. He is also the founder of an e-commerce fashion accessory store that has operated over the last eight years. So with, with $150,000, we want to achieve our three month milestones. If Brittemans is a company that you would love to invest in or be a part of our advisory board, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Well done. Thanks very much for that, Brittany. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, well done. Well done. That, that was great. I might kick off the questions and uh, there's a few more people that have joined us as well uh, <laughs> as we've been progressing. So welcome to you all as well. And I see some hands up coming up already. So that's good. Um, I'll kick it off and then we'll throw to, to Dana Jay or, or Deepak uh, next. Um, Brittany, again, uh, similar to Ashna, uh, why? I know you, you spent a few seconds on your why. Oh, yes. Um, but I think given your experience as well, um, can you tell us, yeah, why? Why and why you in this space? Because this is a, a really good problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. So um, if I look from like my clinical experience as a midwife, um, a part of the education that you provide to women is the vitamins that you can take to support your nutritional well-being, and when you're pregnant, the what you can actually consume in terms of medication is very limited. So women look for high quality and evidence based. So one of those would be folate, for example. Um, and then when I was pregnant, I was like, oh, you know what? I've got this. I'm a midwife. I'll just go to the chemist and I'll just grab what I have told women over the years what they should be taking. And then I went there and I was standing there, I was going, oh my goodness, this, what's inside these vitamins is, is really limiting in terms of what can actually be produced. And when you're looking at that shelf, there's so many different brands um, and they're varying and also in price too. So, you know, you might take your prenatal supplement, so your multivitamin, but then if you've got nausea, you're wanting to look for the... Um, you know, the naturopathic solution to nausea, but that's another brand. So what I found was I was going into my bathroom every morning, getting them all out and having to submit them, um, you know, segment them myself wow. um, every day. So I just 
yeah, it just kind of came to me, why is this easier for women? Like when you're pregnant, your brain gets brain scrambly. <laughs> the last thing you need is to try and shuffle through all that information to try and 100%. find what you need. 100%. That, yeah. It's just such a good problem we've solved. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> great, great answer. All right, let's throw to some questions. Um, Dana Jay, I'm not sure if you still wanted to ask your question. You had your hand up. Or we might just throw it to, to deep back. Oh, was clapping. Back. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Deepak, did you have a question or were you just clapping as well? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> was clapping as well. No, <laughs> but, no but I'll, 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 straight but I'll ask. But I'll, no I'll, 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 I'll ask. I'll ask. I'll ask. <laughs> Uh, made pre yeah. presentation with me. Uh, just one question: Do you have any competitors? Yeah. And and uh, against those competitors, uh, uh, what's your what's your USP? Mm. Right. USP. Um, what's your unique selling point? Oh, unique selling point. Okay, so um, so I'm like, what are these acronyms? Acronyms. Um, so um, so if I my competitor slide, I just predominantly looked at brands that were available for women in Australia. So our unique selling point is that our vitamin packs provide every single vitamin that a woman would need in that particular part of their journey. So for preconception, it's vitamins that will facilitate, will help to provide nutritional well-being for preconception. Then it moves on to first, second, third trimester, and then your postnatal period. So that's when women are breastfeeding or just recovering from a cesarean. So our competitors, um, so for an example, would be Kin. Um, Kin's predominant business is, um, is contraception. However, they've pivoted to look more at the prenatal journey. However, they only offer one multivitamin. So we're actually offering multiple, which is what the pack is. So you don't have to go, okay, I'll get Kin and then I'll have to go to the chemist and pick up um, I don't know, a ginger and vitamin uh, B12 supplement for my nausea. When you come to Britomans, you get it all in one pack. Uh, are you manufacturing them or? or... Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, with the uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration, it is um, highly regulated. So we've had to go with a manufacturer in Australia, um, which is great because Australian um, uh pharmaceutical manufacturing is quite regarded um, internationally. So um, they have provided us with R&D for our specific offerings, um, which has gone through TJ regulation as well to offer a kit um, because everything that you sell has to be registered. So it's a quite a big process, but um, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. The, the, doesn't okay. doctor, doctor I, I mean, the respective guy next, Suggest the right vitamins? Aren't yes. they your competitors? Um, what do you mean by doctors? Sorry. Uh, I, I mean, a doctor, uh, a pregnant woman who is consulting a doctor. So, so, oh, so. yes. Okay. I see what you mean. So, um, in so with doc, with regards to doctors, doctors will just with, and even with myself as a midwife, um, with our registration body, we cannot say that one product is better than the other which is kind of where with, with me being a part of this business um is a little bit of a gray area because I am the founder however I am a midwife so I can't directly say this is better than anyone else's all I'm saying is that we offer everything that you would buy at a chemist um so with a doctor they would say hey you need to go take x y and z go to the chemist and buy those products. However, you're looking at spending, you know, a couple hundred dollars um, as opposed to $50 a month subscription that comes in every month without even you thinking. So um, from, a, from a doctor recommending medication, it would be based on their um, ev evidence-based practice. So if an obstetrician would be Ranscog. Um, so that's where I've based all of our product offering on best evidence. Um, and the manufacturer I work with, they also have to provide the best evidence too, because to get it registered on the TGA, you have to go by what it's actually supposed to be used for. So you can't make wide sweeping claims. It has to be claims that that medication is made for. Does that answer your question? 
Got it. Got it. Thanks. Thanks for ask, uh, answering. And, and Jeremy, please, please go ahead. I'll not ask any further questions. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Thanks, Deepak. Uh, Vanessa. Hey. Um, firstly, that was a really good presentation. I really love that. And as a recent mother myself, um, I would have used your service, definitely. Especially the uh, if you branch out into... Um, lactation biscuits <laughs> I was ordering them online all the time um so that was really good wow. um, where are you going what's your plan for getting the funding that you're asking for what uh areas are you how are you sourcing that yes yeah, so um currently we're bootstrapped so we're trying to do this as lean as possible um i've had the like little discussion with Jeremy about looking at um, what well, he's suggested doing a crowdfunding. So I've been looking into that. Um, ideally, my co-founder and I are looking at um, like a series A VC pitch because ph the pharmaceutical space is very expensive to enter into, which is where um, the conversation with our manufacturer to do an on-demand model initially, it will cost us a bit more. However, that's the sacrifice that we'll have to make for revenue to, for it to get into the market space. So um, then, yeah, so VC eventually, that's kind of where we want to head towards. But um, yeah, looking at bootstrapping and um, yeah, that crowdfunding initially until we kind of get to that um, more traction. Yeah, well, if you go crowdfunding, I'll, I'll put some money oh, in. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For <laughs> I don't have thousands. That's awesome. Evan. That's all right. Five dollars is better than zero. <laughs> and, and exactly, uh, I guess, Vanessa, you've kind of validated uh, the thinking that uh, Brittany was thinking about the crowdfunding is just getting that early traction with some customers. And we're saying even if we've got a thousand customers, you know, mm -hmm. subscribing, that's enough to go to investors and say, well, you know, we can kind of cover the rest. <laughs> uh, but traction is the most important thing in, in early stage. So if we can get some customers like yourself, Vanessa, thank you so much for that support, for Brittany even on the call. So um, yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Um, oh, and Deepak, as you said, share the link. Would love to fund as well. So there you go. Oh, <laughs> thank you. There you go, your crowdfunding campaign is oh, always good. Perfect, um, thank you. Cool, let's throw in some more questions. <clears throat> I think Josh had a question. Oh, did he? Okay. Sure. You kind of covered that a little bit already, Brittany. Oh, sorry, in the chat, yes. Yeah, in the, in the chat. Uh, Josh, I don't know if you want to ask, ask it, but I'll, I'll certainly ask it. I obviously said, well done, uh, Brittany. But what was your outcome from the interactions with the TGA? Did anything uh, change from the initial concept? So, um, mine, so I'll start with the first part, which was the TGA. Very confusing. <laughs> um, uh, so because I've got that technical understanding from being a nurse and a midwife, I kind of understood what they were talking about in a lot of their documents. Um, and I've also got friends who are uh, doctors and pharmacists. So I was able to kind of troubleshoot the technical terminology that we're using. Um, it took a long time, to be honest, with the TGA, because you submit your question, it goes to one of their advisors, they then do their bit of research and then they get back to you. So it's a lot of um, a two-step process a lot of the time when you could try to look for answers. Um, now, with the changing of concept, it's evolving every day. So there's lots of research coming out. So an example is um, probiotics. Probiotics at the moment, there's a massive study happening at King Eddie's about pre preterm birth prevention and colonizing the gut. Um, you know, the microbiome. So um, initially I wasn't going to be offering pro probiotics um, from pre preconception. However, that's something that I'm now looking at. So the process to get all of that started would actually be my manufacturer will submit my request to the TGA on my behalf and then it gets approved. Um, to get that information took a very long time from the TGA. Um, but yeah, which is why it is, um, if people are important, importing from overseas, it gets a little bit tricky because you have to actually have a manufacturer that is um, registered, a registered manufacturer with the TGA, otherwise you're selling um, vitamins illegally. Does that answer your question? Sorry, Josh. 
Yeah, well said. Yeah. Yes, you do. Awesome. <laughs> thank, awesome. You. thank you. Awesome. awesome. Um, I'll ask a question. Yeah. Um, Go on, Jen. I've actually, I'm pregnant at the moment and I can actually ask a question with props because I have like oh, all these things. I've here. just cleaned up my cupboard. Awesome. Yes, exactly. That's it. That's my point. That's yeah. my, um, when I'm. But what my question was, because you've said like at different stages, you know, the packs will be different. But for example, I am, um, I need to take vitamin D. Um, not everyone does in Australia. Um, I'm dairy intolerant so I have to take calcium like will will your packs be personalized to different people's needs or like does it do they need to be yeah so I have thought about that and I mean from I mean from me as a midwife I just think about governance so like if for example a woman's iron deficient are we sending out a kit for them to take a, because there's a company in the US, which I didn't put on my side because I feel like it's very different from our concept, but they send out a blood testing kit. You get it, you get, take your blood test, you send it away. They send you a, this is your unique pack. Um, and all I was thinking was if somebody has got iron deficiency, who's actually looking after that? Because that in pregnancy is dictates a lot of things that happens, you know, if you're iron deficient, you've got a higher chance of, you know, having a postpartum hemorrhage. So I don't want to have our business dealing with that type of governance. So our packs will just be generic, but we'll have upselling products. So if a woman finds out from their doctor that they have vitamin D deficient or iron deficient, we'll have those upselling products as a separate thing that you can then add to your subscription within that month. Does, Yeah. Just because yeah, my mind, awesome. my mind goes into the governance, so I'm just thinking I don't want somebody, poor, some poor woman, to think that what we're giving them is 100 percent. Where they actually still need to go seek medical advice. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Ah, oh, thanks. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, you also made a comment about how impressed you were to find a, a manufacturer, Jen, and I was actually impressed. I don't know if anyone else was about your speed. You said the idea was conceived in December 21. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're talking about really four months, four and a bit months to get to this point. So you, you're moving at a very rapid pace. Um, so can I ask how and, and, and why? What's the driver here? Because that, that's pretty epic. Yeah, so I'm currently on mat leave. So I've got um, outside <laughs> of... <laughs> um, Outside of looking after an eight month old and a two and a half year old, um, I've got some time on my hand and um, which means I'm up at all hours of the night. So if I'm not on my phone emailing somebody at 2 a.m., it's um, the next day at 10. <laughs> so um, the my drive is the fact that I've got a timeline and um, that's going back to work in November. So I want to get as much as I can accomplish in that time. Um, so. It, yeah and I've I mean I've have this have had this discussion with Jeremy um I like things to be done quickly um so if people are not at my pace I will um ask wonder why they're not at my pace um but yeah so everything that I know online about startups is you go hard you go hard and fast and you meet your milestones and you just keep constantly have that pace so like for me the TGA was the most frustrating out of all of it because they just took forever. I'm like, come on, I'm just, can you please give me some clarification? And the R&D, I'm like, okay, come on, we've got to move this along. So um, I'm really am looking forward to um, a launch. We're like looking for September. So I even feel like that's too far away, even then it's not really, but um, it's, yeah, I think that I just want to keep, can, you know, using this pace that I have just to keep, moving forward and meeting those milestones so no, that's yeah. that's awesome we've got a few minutes left i'm going to get everyone out on time at 10 30 wa time but uh maybe one one more one more question i know we've got some investors on the call so the investors will be happy with your your pace Brittany. oh thank you <laughs> i'm certainly i'm sure there'll be someone reaching out to you um one more question from the audience um, yeah, um, can I ask about um, uh, 
personal data, does it affect, um, or have you thought about um, uh, how to secure any personal data um, that you collect from um, people wanting to use your product? Um, that's a really good idea. Uh, sorry, it's a really good question and idea. Um, I'm not technically, in, in terms of um, like the back end, front end developing of that, I'm not really very knowledgeable on that. Something my co founder, Brad, is extremely knowledgeable at. Um, so, in terms of like, are you talking about like encryption of data, data information? Uh, just more of um uh, for the user's um safety in mind because um i guess now uh, in today's age people are more concerned about how much data they're giving out and and, and how much is going to be used for whatever um how do you give oh. them that safety that um you know the data is not going to be um yeah because like you have to collect quite a lot of data i guess yeah yeah like to not selling data do you mean um just that it's being used in the right way or, or oh, okay right yeah way. so um that would definitely be in like our, um, uh, I suppose, it's a really good question. I haven't actually really thought about that, but I, I just on the fly, I would put like terms and conditions in terms of where their data would be used and what it would be used for and ensuring that our website has got encryption. For, so if they are putting in their credit card details, it's a secure payment process. Um, but yeah, I haven't actually, that's a really good point um, that I haven't actually um thought about because in my mind I'm like I would not be using their data for anything other than um taking out their money every month to pay for our product but um yeah I guess um that's something that we would have to like look into and probably flesh out a little bit more to make sure that we are um, ensuring that we are a safe portal yeah thank you thank you good, good, good question yeah data data is very big yeah and will continue to be very important to us in the future, as your PII, et cetera. Um, okay, well, we're bang on 10.30. So uh, I know Ashna had to, had to leave, but um, can I get everyone to un, un mic, uh, my mute, um, and give us a round of applause to, to Brittany and to Ashna. Thank you very much for that, uh, Brittany and Ashna, for, for joining us this morning. Um, we also had, I think, Matthew joined in the, on the call as well. Matthew is one of our directors at um, Launchpad and uh, a big champion for what we do here at, uh, at, at Launchpad and has been for the last three years. So we thank you for your continued support as well, Matthew. Um, Very interesting, <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's okay. Um, and good to see Brittany, one of our Murdoch students, actually, you know, taking something that, like I said, is a big problem in our, in our community and, and yeah, doing something about it. And that's what Launchpad is all about, is supporting you. So thank you very much. And thank you all as well for the questions this morning. It's been in, uh, a really good morning. Um, so thank you for your support uh, and encouragement um, for our founders this morning as well. Our next one will be coming up uh, in semester two now. So we're only doing this four times a year. This is our second one. So our third one, I'm sure Jen and uh, Mel will, will send out the dates uh, as part of the mailing list and check out our socials as well for, our, for that. But uh, yeah, happy Wednesday. Um, Jen, if there's anything else, that I've I'll missed. just add that I will send um, Brittany and Ashna's uh, details to you all so you can um, connect with them if you'd like to. Um, and I think connecting with Brittany, if you'd like to um, maybe be part of the, the potential crowdsourcing <laughs> would be a good idea. I'm sure Brittany would appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I will let you all know when the next startup morning is coming up. It will yeah. be in September. In September. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody, for taking an hour out of your day to support us here at Launchpad. Um, we'll look out for the next one, but uh, have a great and happy Wednesday. See you all.